This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic oh, Society. Professor Dario Galomino, uh, who is an associate professor of numismatics in the Department of Cultures and Civilizations of the University of Verona. He's a classical archaeologist who specializes in Greek and Roman coinage, who holds a BAMA in classical archaeology for Padua University and PhD in ancient history from Verona University. Um, before, uh, the, before coming to Verona, going back to Verona, we have to say, uh, Darius worked at the British Museum Department of Coins and Medals as a British Academy Newton Research Fellow and as a project curator uh, from 2012 to till 2017. Uh, he served on the Council of the Royal Numismatic Society and on the Council of the Roman Society. And he worked at Warwick uh, University Department of Classics uh, in 2017, between 2017 and 2020 as a team member of the project Materiality and Meaning in Greek Festival Culture of the Roman Imperial Period, and is a currently a member of the Roman Provincial Coinage Research Team. Um, he has worked with many Italian museums uh, and col uh, currently collaborates with the Medagliere of the Museo Nazionale Romano to publish the collection of Roman Provincial Coins. And, uh, is currently directing, directing the international scientific project, the Roman Emperor, seen from the provinces, funded for five years by the European Research Council. And uh, I'm almost done. Among his <laughs> numerous publications, it is worth mentioning here his studies on the coinage of the city of Nicopolis in Epirus, on imperial iconography in the provinces, and on die sharing between cities of Asia Minor, especially in the third century AD. And together with Anthony Burnett, he also published RPC 6, uh, covering the provincial coinage from uh, um, Ella Gabalos to Maximinus Trax, and who is now available online. So <laughs> please let wow. me know if I forgot some. No, I mean, it's just that you did so much and it's actually very relevant to remember, to remember, to let everybody know. I mean, I mean, possibly all of these people know. So anyway, now uh, let me introduce again and thank Dario for being with us. So, and then I can, it's your turn and I'll mute myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, again. So, okay, so um, again, thank you again for the invite. Uh, Emma, uh, Nathan, uh, Lucia, I can see Jill as well. So thank you, everyone. It's really a privilege to be here uh, with you today. Um, so as Lucia has uh, explained, uh, it's a very uh, flattering uh, introduction. Um, my main field of interest and expertise is Roman provincial coinage, with a special focus on the third century AD. And, and I started to work on this category of coins back in uh, 2007 for my PhD dissertation on the coins of Nicopolis and Epirus. And then basically I never stopped. Um, and, I, and I became and became essentially my main occupation from 2012 when as Lucia remembered, I joined the Department of the Coins and Medals of the British Museum to work on the RPC project. Um, so today's talk is about one of the case studies in Roman Provincial Coinage, which I have more extensively investigated over the past five years in my research, the coinage of Nicaea in Bithynia. I must stress that this was not a specific research project, and in fact, it was never my intention to focus on this topic in the first place, but I became increasingly interested in the mint as I realized that essentially in every research project on which I embark, be it smaller or bigger, Nicias coins often came up as something truly remarkable and worth investigating. Um, so I first came across Nicaea while I was working on RPC uh, volume six, which, as, again, as Lucia recalled, covers the period from Elagabalus to Maximian's tracks. And this gave me the opportunity to appreciate for the first time the sheer volume of production of this mint, at least for the late Severan period. 
Um, uh, and I also uh, and came across Nicaea, uh, obviously, uh, generally speaking, in my research, but also more specifically when I moved to um, Warwick, or to Warwick University. Um, when Nicaea uh, came, uh, came across Nicaea as a special case study for especially the originality and variety of its coin designs uh, in the collaborative project on the materiality of Greek festivals in the Roman East, in which I essentially was uh, studying uh, the Roman provincial coins from the Roman East associated with local festivals. And uh, Nicaea plays again a prominent role among Asian, uh, Asian minor mints in my broader study of the emperor's worship and imagery in the provinces, which is the very topic of my, um, of my current ERC project mentioned again by Lucia. So, uh, which is, means essentially uh, is the title is Resp, the Roman Emperor seen from the provinces. Um, so, this is why essentially. Uh, I also decided to um, choose the, the, the word atypical for the provincial mint of Nicaea in my title, uh, by which I mean essentially a mint whose behavior appears to be different from the majority of the other civic mints in the imperial provinces. And, um, sorry, and I am deliberately using the term civic instead of provincial here to distinguish between how in purely conventional terms, scholars usually uh, refer to the hundreds of cities striking coins autonomously under the empire, as you can see in the map uh, provided by the RPC online based at Oxford um, database, as opposed to the very few ones which served almost as subsidiary means in, of Rome in the provinces which are essentially Alexandria in Egypt, Caesarea in Cappadocia, Antioch in um, uh, Syria, besides the cystophoric coinage produced by uh, more than one mints in the province of Asia. So all these mints stand out for their incomparably higher volume and continuity of production, not only in bronze, but also in silver or billion circulating throughout the province and often beyond its borders. Nicaea falls definitely within the former category of civic means, and yet it stands out from the rest in a number of aspects which I will discuss in this presentation. And this is a short summary uh, of what um, uh, my presentation will be about. So first point is the output, which is larger than the vast majority of the civic means uh, recorded in Roman provincial coins database. Second is that Nicaea has a workshop of dye engravers, which created a huge variety of reverse designs, as I was mentioned before, often completely original creations, which ended up influencing the choice of designs in other cities. Third is the unique production of silver cystophory under, under the Severance. And the fourth and last point is the unique production of bronze coins aimed specifically at providing small chain supply for a different region of the empire than that of the of origin. So on the basis of all these aspects considered together, I will argue that the mint of Nicaea was more than a common civic mint, which in certain periods might have been entrusted by the provincial administration to act as a proper provincial mint. So I will start with a short introduction on the city. Uh, ancient Nicaea lies underneath more than its nick in the district of Bursa on the shores of Lake Ascanius in Northern Anatolia, some 130 kilometers south of Istanbul. The city was founded in an area originally colonized by people from central Macedonia as Antigoneia by Antigonus and Monophthalmus in around 310 BC. And it was later renamed Nicaea by Lysimachus after his wife when he defeated Antigonus in 301 BC. Uh, maybe I can hide this so you can see more of the slides. Um, 
The history of Nicaea in the Roman period is not very well known, especially because it is usually hard to disentangle from that of its counterpart, Nicomedia. Um, the two communities were divided by a long-standing rivalry over the leadership of Bithynia, as it is described especially in the well-known Oration 38 by Dio Chrysostom, which invited the Nicomedians to enjoy the benefits of concord instead of pointlessly quarreling with their neighbors. In the eyes of the Bithynian or or orator, their dispute was essentially an empty clash of names, which hinged on the exclusive right to be regarded as metropolis, literally the mother town, but essentially used to be the capital city, and Prote Bithynias, the first city of Bithynia. However, the contrast between the Comedia and Nicaea was more than a local affair. It was a matter of international diplomacy, which was largely affected by the role played by Rome and the imperial family in this rivalry. Imperial acknowledgement of the city's hierarchy and provincial ranking was a key factor, hence their constant efforts to win the favors of the central authority. As it was masterful, masterfully described by Louis Robert in his well-known essay titled La Gloire et la Haine, The Glory and Hatred, which was largely based on the material evidence of coin legends and inscriptions. Cassius Dye reports that in the Augustan age, Nicaea was honored above all the others and was called a, metropol a metropolis by its trouble. However, Nicaea's role appears to have been constantly overshadowed by that of Nicomedia, which had been the capital of the Hellenistic reign and probably took on the leadership of the province under the Julio Claudians and held it for most of the second and the third centuries. One key element of the dispute was the bestowal of Neocoroi titles, the privilege to host the provincial temple for the imperial cult, which depended entirely on the city's relationship with the imperial family and on, the, on, the, and on imperial approval. This is why it is very important, in my opinion, to look at Nicaea's coinage from a perspective that pays special attention to the community's relationship with Rome and the provincial government. Nicomedia was Neocoros almost by royal prerogative and as the metropolis of the Bithynian coinon since the Hellenistic period, whereas Nicaea was never properly a Neocoros. Unlike Nicaea, later Nicomedia could also boast the dedication of further Neocori temples, two under Commodus and uh, three under Elagabalus, which were timely advertised on its coins and on public monuments, as we can see, for instance, in the coin to the right, which is indeed struck under Commodus. On top of that, Nicaea was punished by Septimius Severus for siding with Persenius Niger in May 100, 194, having all his civic privileges and titles revoked. And still Nicaea seems to have promptly regained imperial favor as it was accorded permission to host sacred Severan festivals to honor Caracalla and Geta. Also the mint steady productivity of this period suggests that the city continued to thrive under the new dynasty. A sign of great financial wealth, it could also be viewed as a way of enhancing the community's reputation to counterbalance the gap in rank with a rival in Comedia. Very little survives of the Roman town apart from the imposing city walls during the third century AD, which were incorporated into the Byzantine walls. Even smaller is what remains of Roman buildings, such as the baths and the theater, which we can see here in the map, about which Pliny the Younger complained in a letter to Trajan that the citizens of Nicaea had already exhausted over above 10 millions of sesterces for restoration works before they were even finished, which may give us again an idea of the community's wealth of resources already in the second century AD. In this picture also, uh, we see one of the two Roman gates, which are still standing, the left, left gate on the eastern side of the walls, which bears an inscription commemorating Hadrian for helping the community after an earthquake. And the inscription lists major honors granted to Nicaea, again, the first city of Bithynia and Pontus and Metropolis by imperial and senatorial decision. It also says that the city was regarded as Neocoros of the Augusti, Neocoros ton Sebaston, 
it was not quite the same as hosting a temple dedicated to one emperor in particular. Sorry, this is the gate and uh, the location on the map. So I'm showing here the main references on the coins of, of Nicaea and uh, listed below uh, all the um, uh, contributions in which I have started uh, um, the main uh, from which I have extracted the presentation of today or most of the topics that I'm going to discuss today. As it is often the case, Carnage is still the richest and most informative historical source on the religious, mythical, and cultural traditions of Nicaea. The mint was active with a very regular production from Augustus to Gallienus, and the standard reference for the coins of Nicaea is still volume 1.3 of the Requel General de Monicrec, published at the beginning of the 20th century, alongside a catalog published by Pfizer in 1983. But as today, there is no die study on any of the periods of production of the mint, and not even a comprehensive corpus of coins from any of them. And with all the limits of such an old catalog based primarily on what was accessible in the main public collections in Europe, the Requel General still gives us uh, a starting point to assess, to try to assess the scale of this coinage, especially in proportion to other Bithynian cities and of Nicomedia itself. So based on the number of issues listed in the catalog in the Requel General in the period from Augustus to Gallienus, Nicomedia has overall 281 issues, while Nicaea has 624. So the capital's output seemed to have been roughly one third of that of its rival Nicaea. And this is, I think, already quite surprising. A more accurate picture can be inferred from the figures generated by the RPC online database. The database is still not complete, but with eight published volumes out of the 10 expected to cover the entire period of production from the death of Julius Caesar to AD 297, when uh, the mint of uh, Alexandria in Egypt was closed for good, we already, we are already looking at very reliable statistics. The, target, the catalog is complete up to the death of Commodus, so volumes one to four, in the third century, volume six, seven, nine, and 10 are now complete, whereas volume five, Septimius Severus to Macrinus, and eight, Philip the Arab, are still in progress, even though the colleges in crucial regions such as Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt are fully covered too. So, um, if we interrogate the database on the number of recorded coin types, combining all of those varieties with all the known reverse types, the results are surprising to say the least. As you can see from the chart here, besides Alexandria and Egypt, which can be essentially regarded as an imperial mint in Egypt, Nicaea, underlined in green, is the second mint for number of types recorded. The Bithynian mint comes before Antioch in Syria and Caesarea of Cappadocia, besides other civic mints of great magnitude such as Ephesus and Corinth, and including Nicomedia as well, which sits among the top 10, as we can see also better from this slide where we have two columns uh, listing the ranking essentially of the cities by number of types and by number of specimens. So if we switch and look and prioritize the number of specimens as it is here, uh, um, we have probably even more reliable figures uh, because they can be inferred from the number of specimens and entered in the database for each mint. This seems to make more sense as Alexandria is largely dominating the chart, as you can see, we're at nearly 80,000 specimens, um, and is followed by Antioch and Caesarea, which are both proper provincial mints, as I said before, so this makes perfect sense. Nevertheless, Nicaea, which was second in the previous chart, is now no less than fifth place immediately after Ephesus. And this is still very impressive, I think, if we consider that the data entered on Ephesus are based on one of the most comprehensive uh, studies carried out on Roman provincial mint, the volume published by Carbise in 2012, which includes finds from excavations 
and a full catalog of dyes employed by the mint. While for Nicaea, as I said before, we can currently rely only on a basic collation of coins from core collection and auction catalogs. Overall, it must be considered that the three provincial mints included in the chart had a very large and regular output of silver coins besides the bronze ones, which ranks them on a completely different scale of production than Nicaea, which makes the figures of the Bithynian city to me even more remarkable. And also, again, if we consider the number of types in which Nicaea is second uh, only to uh, Alexandria, the outstanding ranking here uh, truly does justice to the incredibly wide range of reverse type of its iconographic repertoire, which as we shall see, is one of the most distinctive characteristics of its coinage. Um, so it looks like the civic coinage was an opportunity for the Nicene minting workshop to expand considerably its imagery repertoire, especially from the end of the Antonine period, which may reflect a broader process of renovation and diversification in the language of visual communication of public media. And this is actually the first aspect that I wish to discuss in more detail. So an overview of the iconographic repertoire of the mint would certainly exceed the scope of this paper and would probably be of little interest. So I shall briefly present one category of coin designs which show how on more than one occasion, the workshop was the first to introduce completely new imagery on coinage in the provinces. These are the so-called agonistic types. The reverse designs that advertised and celebrated agonistic festivals in the Roman East. Hundreds of cities celebrated their festival of civic coins from the end of the second century uh, AD and, and throughout the third century. They became exceedingly popular and fashionable, especially because the games had to be approved and patronized by the Imperial Mint. So they were also an opportunity to stress that the hosting communities were closely connected to the Imperial House. The imagery of the games drew upon a very small range of subjects, reflecting the appeal of the principal attractions of the agonistic world, prizes and athletes. However, coin designs also increasingly emphasized Imperial endorsement of civic festivals, which became largely associated with the rituals and practice of Imperial glorification and worship. This quickly became a fairly standardized agonistic visual language that spread from one workshop to another throughout Asia Minor, the Levant and the Balkans. So a good example of standardization of types can be easily appreciated also by comparing the coins of Nicaea and Nicomedia in this slide, associated with their respective uh, agonistic festivals under Valerian and Gallienus which were the last issues of both means be before they quit their production uh, permanently. They adopted exactly the same reverse designs in both cities, and it seems apparent, apparent that they were copying each other, perhaps because they were even sharing the same workshop. So uh, we have two examples, one in which on the reverse, they have the unusual combination of three imperial portraits, including obviously that of Valerian, Gallienus and of Valerian II, whereas on the reverse, they have three prize crown each, which were obviously the prizes given to the winners of the games. And below we have two issues of Gallienus, which are quite specular as well. Uh, this is even more compelling because they both show a city personification holding, in one case, Nicomedia, three temples, again, symbolizing the three Neocore temples, and three prizes, prize crowns in the hands of the personification of Nicaea, perhaps as a sort of compensation for not having the privilege to display any Neocorus title at all. So this is the kind of standardization that I was talking about. However, the situation was very different half a century before. Uh, when Nicaea was literally the first means to create new imagery associated with the local festivals to stress its relationship with Rome. And uh, um, sorry, and all the uh, types that were minted by Nicaea 
would soon become a model to follow for the other means. The College of Commodus saw the genesis of a new visual program designed on one hand to advertise agonistic festivals and on the other to use festival culture to connect the community to the emperor. Nicaea began to create agonistic designs expressly to celebrate the fact that new festivals had been established to praise the emperor and they were called the Commodeia, as we can see on the legend and the point to the left, which meant also creating a whole new visual language to honor the emperor. A meaningful aspect of the promotion of Nicaea's festival is indeed the fact that it always had a prominent imperial character. The main strand of designs focused on the showcase of agonistic prizes, which were soon copied by other means, including the comedia, as we can see here. For instance, this is the first ever example of a coin showing two prize crowns on a table in the imperial provinces, an image that would become incredibly widespread in the provincial colleges soon afterwards. And this was introduced at Nicaea on the Commodus and was copied at Nicomedia only a few years later on the Septimius Severus. But the coins of Commodus also started to feature depictions of athletes yet to become another popular subject in the third century in other regions, especially in Thrace and Pisidia, which may have borrowed iconographic models from other media, such as, again, painting and mosaics. Here we can see uh, the athlete, um, the image of an athlete crowning himself and holding a palm branch in the other hand, in exactly the same uh, poster as uh, um, an athlete depicted on a very well-known mosaic from Patras, which is dated roughly in the same period between the second and the third century AD. Athletic designs include the depiction of fine group scenes with three nude male figures preparing to perform in the contests. The earlier example of a coin iconography that may have been again inspired by well-defined visual model, perhaps a painting, and which would in turn influence other civic coinages adopting exactly the same iconography. So we can see again here, the first ever example of this iconography for the Commodeia games celebrated at Nicaea on the Commodus, and uh, exactly the same iconography being copied uh, under Caracalla uh, at Byzantium a few years later. A variant of this model in which the wrestlers are standing around an urn to draw lots before starting to train or to perform, started to be copied on coins of other cities a few decades later, such as Perintus and um, Perintus under, under Caracalla, a Philippopolis under Elagabalus, and again in Pisidia under Severus Alexander. So this is one of the clearest examples of a model being essentially created uh, from scratch and Nicaea, and then be copied by other means uh, in this time span of a few decades. Other issues mentioned in the games show the legend Commodeia within a Tetra style temple, possibly implying that it was devoted to the imperial cult. The centrality of the emperor in the Nicene festivals, though, was better emphasized by another design, indeed quite extraordinary. A variation of the mainstream iconography featuring agonistic prizes displayed on a table, it showed a sculptural bust of the emperor himself, Commodus, among two crowns we, you can see in the coin above. This imagery was being designed and Nicaea specifically for the local festivals because it remained unparalleled in the provinces. It almost certainly refers to public ceremonies involving the presentation of sacred images of the emperor to the audience, which was part of the rituals associated with the emperor's worship. These were, we, these were portable sacred icons of members of the imperial family that used to be held in local temples for worship and then brought out and carried in processions across the city on special occasions, mostly liturgical and festive days. During festivals, there usually was a public ceremony in which the sacred images were displayed before the crowd assembled in the theater. And the Nicene issue of Commodus may have immortalized that very moment. The same theme was continued by the means under the Severus, and we, as we can see in the two examples below, 
On the Bronze Series, celebrating the Imperial Dynasty and its Philadelphia Games, the special festivals uh, celebrated at Nicaea to honor the Brotherhood of Caracalla and Geta, so the Concord for the future of the empire uh, under the Severan uh, the Dynasty. And here we can see exactly the same scene, except that we have two busts displayed on the table instead of one. Those are obviously the two busts of the young emperors facing each other. The whole imagery adopted on the issues commemorated in the Severan Philadelphia Games was clearly linked to the dynastic propaganda of Concord promoted on all visual media in Rome. This is apparent, especially in the designs showing again, the two young emperors facing each other, but in full figure this time on this coin of Julia Domna, standing on either sides of a table holding a, uh, a table which is holding a prize crown. This is an iconography that was clearly inspired by um, and deliberately referring to the well-known Concordia Augustorum issues, which were struck in Rome uh, from the Antonine period, which, we, which show essentially the, the two emperors in Rome uh, holding a Nike together. Uh, the extensive use of imperial imagery on the coins of Nicaea, partly following the metropolitan iconographic models, as in this case, and partly also creating new ones, is a distinctive pattern that characterizes a large part of the main production. This probably reflected the aspirations of Nicaea to align with imperial policy and to play a key role in the Severan provincial strategy, as well as to become the leading minting workshop in the third century Bithynia. And again, this design created for the Philadelphia Games became a model that inspired other mints in the celebration of their own imperial festivals. Like for instance, again, Byzantium under Caracalla shown exactly or a very similar design, clearly inspired by the previous one. So after discussing the role of Nicaea as a pioneering workshop in the creation of coin imagery in the provinces, especially in connection with special celebration of the imperial family, we now begin to look at some case studies in the coins of Nicaea, which in my opinion suggest that in the Severan period, Nicaea became a minting workshop of higher rank. The first period in this, in the, is, sorry, the first episode is the minting of Sistofori in the early Severan age. Silver Sistofori served as the provincial currency of the Roman province of Asia since this was established in the second century BC and continued to do so under Augustus. Under Nerva, Trajan, and Hadrian, this production was embraced by numerous cities across Asia Minor, other than just Ephesus and Pergamon, which were possibly the first two means, obviously, to strike coins in the first period. The Severan Sistophoric coinage was the last segment of production following a significant hiatus under the Antonines. It was the subject of a thorough investigation by Mill Metcalf based on a dye study on all the specimens known in 1988. Only one aspect of this work remained unresolved, the identification of the means or means of origin, for which he only tentatively suggested Caesarea and Cappadocia, along the lines of Martin Leaf's first interpretation in the absence of better alternatives. In my recent study of these coins based on the analysis of both old materials and of some new ones, that were auctioned in recent years, I proposed that Nicaea was actually the city of production on the basis of two criteria, the style of imperial portrait and the choice of reverse designs. Metcal was actually looking specifically for style similarities with provincial means that could have issued the Sistofri. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, these similarities can be observed quite clearly especially on the issues that um, depict the male members of the family. So Septimus Severus, Caracalla, and Geta. I'm showing here for lack of time only the most apparent similarities in three different issues, which uh, I think make Nicaea the best candidate for the mint of origin. So this is the first one that we can see the portrait of Septimius Severus on Sistophorus and on a contemporary coin of Nicaea, in which by the way, Again, the Philadelphia games are being celebrated with the portraits of Caracalla and Geta being displayed on a prize table. 
Here is another example of Jan Caracalla, which we can see, I think, very similar portraits on a Sistophoros and on a much smaller coin uh, struck in bronze. And this is Geta, where we have a Sistophoros uh, depicting him riding a horse and holding a spear, and uh, below a small issue uh, of Nicaea uh, featuring a temple on the reverse. My interpretation, as I said, hints also on the fact that almost every reverse design used on the Severan Sistophori found a match in contemporary Nicene reverse types, especially the ones that celebrate members of the imperial family, such uh, specifically as the one uh, that I mentioned before, in which the emperor is riding a horse, which we can see again here. But we can also see the similarities in the structure of the designs for instance, in the use of very long legends, uh, naming the emperor on the Sistophoros and, uh, and mentioning again the Philadelphia games on this issue of Geta. Again, the use of the same imagery on other coins of Nicaea uh, under Julia Domna showing one member, one male member of the imperial family riding a horse. And here are other examples of Caracalla uh, featuring on the coins of Nicaea, the very typical um, design with three uh, um, vexilla, including an aquila, uh, an eagle in between. And again, another one showing Caracalla riding a horse. So it might be no coincidence that the Sistophori were roughly contemporary to the Nicaean coins promoting the Severum Philadelphia festivals which as I said before, were constantly informed by a prominent imperial character. Here we also see another example of a Dextrarum Junctio scenes in the shaking of hands between Caracalla and Geta on a price table on this coin of Giulia Donna. And uh, another one in which the traditional image of the imperial triumph on, on, on a quadriga has the additional detail of the emperor holding a prize crown. So, Again, discussing the Sistophori, comparing compared to the large production of Sistophori of Hadrian, the much smaller scale of the Severan coinage might have required the minting activity to be concentrated in a single city. Unlike Hadrian, unlike the coinage of Hadrian, um, any reference to the provincial authority was omitted from the reverse legends. But the main turning point in the production of Severan Sistophori is that they were made in Bithynia, but not in Nicomedia, which was actually the mint of the Sistophori issued under Hadrian on behalf of the Bithynian coin. And we can see one example here. This suggests that in the early Severan period, Nicaea was so prominent to be able to afford to take on such an onerous task and to, uh, as to produce silver coins for circulation in the province instead of the provincial capital. This scenario appears to be definitely confirmed by what happens less than two de decades later, which I'm going to discuss in the last part of my talk. This time we are in the late and post Severan age, the period ranging from the reigns of Severus Alexander to that of Gordian III. Within the vast coin production in their names by Bithynian means, a large group of bronze coins stand out for some very peculiar characteristics. The most evident one is that they share the same reverse design showing three or four vexilla, as we can see in these examples here. So they can be loosely regarded as military designs. They also belong to the same small denomination measuring around 20 millimeters and weighing around four to five grams, possibly the local Asarian, which was equivalent to a light Roman ass. Besides Nicaea, another two Bithynian means issued these coins in the same period. They are Nicomedia itself and Uliopolis, which are located on the map. However, the production of specimens from these two means is incomparably, incomparably smaller than those of Nicaea. So Nicaea was definitely the main center of production, if not even the only workshop in charge which may have minted also on behalf of the, others, the other two. Anyway, what truly makes these issues unique is that they are found in huge quantities in Eastern Europe, especially along the Danube. 
This is exceptional as civic coins of such medium low denominational value were intended for the local circulation and barely traveled beyond the city's territory. So they were definitely not suitable for use in long range exchanges. And the two graphs here show the number of specimens found in each province based on excavations carried out, especially in the last 10 years in modern Serbia and Romania. And as you can see, they show that Moesia Superior is yielding by far the vast majority of finds compared to Dacia, which also has a substantial number, Thrace and Moesia Inferior. The map here shows more precisely where the coins cluster, even though they tend to turn up quite regularly in lower Dacia, modern Romania, the highest concentration of finds clusters around the two major sites in Moesia Superior, Viminacium and Singidunum, which you can see also in the uh, map, in the smaller map, uh, uh, the top right of the slide. Recent excavations, especially from the necropolis of Viminacium, document that these issues form almost the entire bulk of small bronze coins in circulation in this period. So they were the local bronze currency in the region. This means that they did not simply travel across the Bosphorus as a result of trade or contacts of people, but that they were transported or shipped to one or more destinations in Upper Asia. The proportion of civic coins coming from a different region or province was always minimal, with the exception, as I said before, of the proper provincial issues, especially in silver, designed to serve almost as subsidy imperial currency. For instance, the tetradrams from Northern Syria, as well as the Rome series mark SC, um, which circulated throughout the Levant and beyond. Civic coins traveling beyond their province of, orig uh, of origin on a larger scale are only attested very rarely such as, for instance, the several issues from Peloponnese and Pontus, which are found in Syrian sites, especially Dura Europos, and they have been traditionally explained as moving along with the troops, although not being specifically struck for that purpose. The phenomenon of the Bithynian issues dominating the coin circulation in AD 222-244 of Apomisia and Dacia can only fit within a scenario whereby the absence of local civic means had caused a dramatic shortage of, shortage of small change in circulation, possibly enhanced by the drop in production of smaller bronze imperial denomination under Septimius Severus, which might have partially filled this gap in the past. The different pattern of coin use in most of lower Mesia and Thrace, where Bithynian coins are recovered in much smaller numbers, can be explained as a consequence of the fact that the main cities were producing their own small bronze denominations on a regular basis. Therefore, foreign coins like those from Bithynia were simply not needed. Conversely, the need for small change in Upper Moesia must be put in relation to the presence of the army. The geographical concentration of finds within an extensively militarized area has its core in Viminacium and in Singidunum, which hosted respectively the Legio 7th Macedonica, better known as Claudia Pia Fidelis, and the Legio 4th Flavia Felix. These were arguably the main recipients of these coins. This is the main cluster marked on this, by the red circle. <clears throat> these coins were not only transported in this region, but probably also struck on a large scale for the purpose of being used in local circulation as small change. This is confirmed by the fact that they hardly feature among the coin finds in Asia Minor and the Levant, and particularly in Bithynia itself, where they are almost completely absent from the finds recorded in major sites, for instance, Uliopolis, one of the mint mentioned uh, in the legends, uh, which should have been essentially one of the workshops producing these coins, and for instance, Tium. Um, and they're also absent or almost completely absent in other nearby sites in which coins finds have been extensively published, as for instance, Troy, Assos, and Sinope. 
such an exceptional movement of city coins from a different province may have been requested by the military authorities that were faced with a critical shortage of modern ammunition supply in an area where Roman soldiers formed a very large part of the local population. The role played by provincial and especially imperial authorities in this process is hard to define. No doubt this uh, kind of experiment preluded to the resolution to establish a new center for local supply in situ at the Minacium itself. As a result, the establishment of a colonial mint at the Minacium in AD 239, followed by the opening of a Dacian mint, probably Apulum or Sarmitegetica, which issued, uh, which meant the um, Provincia Dacia issues, uh, immediately afterwards, did not simply cause the flow of coins from Bithynia to stop at once during the reign of Gordian, but actually led to the almost complete end of the production of these sort of military issues as a whole. The natural conclusion of this process occurred only a few decades later, right? Um, when both colonial mints of Viminacium and Provincia Dacia closed for good to be replaced by the new imperial mint of Viminacium that issued silver radiates. That the fact that these series were designed for a specific purpose and for a certain category of users in a particular region of the empire is ultimately confirmed by the choice of designs adopted on their reverses, as their military character appears to address deliberately the recipients for whom they were intended, the legions and the auxiliary troops. They were neither produced nor supplied to pay the army, but to meet the demand for small chain supply for daily use generated by the increasingly stable presence of the legions in the region. The volume of coins invading the local markets seems to suggest that they were being shipped in stocks, perhaps being carried along by the troops themselves as they moved west. There are similar examples, but only in the imperial production. For instance, the so-called consignments of quadrantes uh, to the uh, Rhine lines in the upper and lower Germany uh, under the reign of Domitian, which have been extensively studied by Fleur Kemmers, and also the supply on the, of the Lupa Traiana semises in the Balkans, especially in Thrace and lower Moesia, which has been published, studied and published by Bernard Wojtek. In both cases, it has been proposed that these issues, which are hardly found in excavations elsewhere, were shipped and blocked from Rome to their military destinations. The Imperial administration occasionally also followed a similar procedure to supply a specific region of the empire with provincial issues, uh, which means uh, issues featuring Greek legends um, made in Rome on in Antioch for the local circulation as, it as if it was not connected with the presence, as if it was connected with the presence of the army, sorry. So for instance, in uh, Cyrenaica or in Crete, just to mention some instances. The great anomaly here is of course, the fact that unlike all other known examples of regional issues made in Rome and other imperial means, the Bithynian issues retain their own civic name in the, rest, in the reverse legends, so they look like civic coins, even though they behave like super provincial currency. On the long term, this might have looked like an aberration that needed to be fixed. So the colonial coins of Iminacium and the Provincia Dacia designed to serve this purpose did not only bear military design like their predecessors, but they also featured explicitly the name of the respective local mints in the legend. If the central authority was responsible for this process to some extent, then we should assume that Nicaea played a special role in the provincial strategy of the empire in this period. So we can come to some conclusions to summarize what I have discussed in this presentation uh, as here. The first is that throughout the Roman period, but especially from the end of the second century AD, so from the reign of Commodus, Nicaea was a well-established and very prolific mint. In fact, much more prolific than Nicomedia, in spite of this becoming more politically prominent than its rival after the civil clash between Septimius Severus and Pesenius Niger. 
The workshop of dye engravers that served Nicaea supplied many other cities on a fairly wide geographical range, reaching as far as Phrygia in the south and even Byzantium in the west. This is still based on the uh, major study on the uh, system of workshop in Asia Minor published by uh, Conrad Kraft in the 70s, which is still the main reference for the study of uh, dye sharing and uh, um, uh, greater sharing, at least for a large part of the province of Asia. And for Bithynia itself, where we can see, for instance, that obverse dyes of Severus used in Nicaea were also employed on coins of Sagalassus in Pisidia, which is one of the longest distance uh, of dye sharing connections attested in Asia Minor. So, as the second point, we can say that the extraordinary creativity on the Nicaea's workshop engravers that we have seen in the many examples that I've uh, presented may be part of the same set of skills and expertise. And it may also derive from the choices made by the civic administration and the civic elites, which seem to have been particularly keen to manifest their allegiance to the imperial family, perhaps because the community established special diplomatic connections with Rome. And the last point, which I would like to stress, is that the capability of the Nicaea workshop to cope with a large maintenance demand and with a geographically expanded network of customers may have made it a qualified candidate to devote a special branch of its production to two very special productions. One is the silver cystophory, despite the fact that Nicomedia was the only mint that had struck silver coinage before in the province. And second, the supply of huge stocks of small change for the legions in a totally different region of the empire, such as the Danube region, with which Nicaea had no apparent connections in a way that only proper provincial means used to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dario. This is uh, amazing, uh, really. And uh, do we have uh, we have uh, ten minutes left because we don't want to impinge even more longer on your time. But do we have any questions, or should I? Uh, I don't see any any questions. Uh, so. Gilles, I think it was. Oh, oh Gilles. I saw yes. hand. Question. Ah, sorry, sorry. You were just sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't see. Oh, I didn't yeah. see any hand. But otherwise, um, I have a question. So, of course, the final battle between uh, Pescianius Nigrus uh, and Septimius Severus uh, uh, takes place uh, in Nicaea, and right after this, basically, we have this uh, rise of uh, Nicaea to prominence and so of course the beginning I'm, I'm totally convinced by the fact that uh, the Sever the severance is were actually issued in Nicaea so do you think this has to be as to do exactly like the the prominence uh, of Nicaea derives from the fact for example that Pescianius Negrus we know the Pescianius Negrus gave a lot of importance to this city uh, so has to do with Pescianius Negrus, or you think that this was chosen then later on by Septimius Severus? So when does begin this preeminence of Nicaea over Nicomedia, for example? Well, um, yes, this is precisely the point. Is a is a prominence that uh, might look uh, only um, uh, partial, uh, in, to the extent that, uh, of course. Uh, we know that Nicaea lost its privileges uh, after the uh, civil mm -hmm. war. And I would say that the, the, the episode of Pesenius Negro was so short-lived that it can hardly have affected in such a way uh, the political situation at, Nicom at, at Nicaea. So um, I would say that it was uh, something that happened later. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, um, uh, Nicaea uh, was affected economically by all these sanctions, because mm -hmm. as we said before, and as has been again mentioned uh, uh, by Robert, but also in the, in, the, in, the, in the ancient authors, it was pretty much a clash of titles, kind of empty titles, not necessarily 
connected to the financial uh, stability of the city and of, and of its resources. I think Nicaea was already a very wealthy community. And um, what we see from coinage was, of course, a kind of a response to what had happened before. And uh, it is indeed very difficult to explain how in the a time span of only a few years, because this is what we are talking about, we can see uh, the mint uh, celebrating so um, lavishly, in a way, the new dynasty, and then being entrusted with uh, uh, the production of Sistopoli, which was, of course, a task uh, of major importance. Um, I think somehow they have, might have managed to, uh, let's say, make up for their mistakes. Um, and this might, uh, in fact, uh, support my idea that uh, the elite uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, Nicaea were somehow close to the imperial family. Uh, why they chose the wrong side under Pesenius Niger a few years ago, before, I think it's, it's impossible to explain. But it, we might perhaps think of, uh, a, of a new leadership in, in, the, in the city administration after that which might have changed completely the course of the, of the also the, the mint activity. Thank you very much. I, we have a question uh, here um, from, for example, Curtis. I don't know if he wants to, uh, yes, and uh, ask the question himself. Okay, so um, you mentioned Nicaea, wasn't a proper Neocoros, but the city gate uh, inscription mentioned a different kind of uh, Neocoros status. What is the difference? Well, we don't know exactly what the difference is because uh, I don't think we have many other instances. I, I, I'm, I'm, this is based mainly on the, I think, great book by Barbara Burrell on the Neocoro. Mm -hmm. um, uh, essentially, the, the, the way in which it's phrased, so Neocoroi of the Sebastoi, it's, um, it, it, it's kind of a unicum, as, as far as I know, and specifically the fact that, that it doesn't refer to one emperor in particular, it might, again, sound some like sort of compensation for the fact that they didn't uh, have the privilege to host one temple, provincial temple dedicated to one emperor in particular. It sounds like a sort of Sebastian to, to say, to, to find a possible comparison, maybe what we have in Aphrodisias. So a general building dedicated to the imperial family, um, but uh, it doesn't sound as good as uh, being the Neocoros of, uh, the Neocoros of one emperor, of Hadrian, of Commodus, or any other else, any other one. And we're pretty sure that uh, or at least I think that um, if uh, this had been a valuable title, valuable in terms of obviously uh, honor and, and prestige, uh, uh, I think the, the Nicaean mint wouldn't have failed to advertise it on coins. Whereas this is very weird. We do not find any mention of Neocoro titles on the coins of Nicaea, whereas Nicomedia only a few kilometers away was obviously showing off uh, an infinite list of uh, neocoroid titles at any time. So my, my theory is specifically that Nicaea, at least through coinage, and we can't, unfortunately, there is not much left of the other evidence, but perhaps it was the same on all visual media. Nicaea was trying to compensate for the great disadvantage that she, they were suffering from, from uh, being um, the second in, in the province after Nicomedia, with all these overflow of uh, titles, of uh, uh, honors dedicated specifically to the imperial family. Okay, thank you. Sorry, you, and, uh, you, you I have touched the microphone, maybe I they didn't hear well. No, so. no, we, oh, okay. um, there is a question from the audience, then also yet, Gilles. Do you agree with Weiser denomination chart? from Tom, uh, page 170. What about denominations prior to his chart? Um, I'm afraid I, I don't remember the denomination chart at page uh, 170, Tom. Sorry about that. I mean, maybe if you can 
refresh my memory. Maybe I, I can I can help you a little bit more because I don't remember what it, the, the, the where where's the the, the the switch. Yeah, thank right. you. Yeah, okay, Gilles. Yes, um, thank you uh, for this very very interesting presentation. So, um, what seems to be happening? It's uh, uh, we all know that a few years later, after the severance, we, we, we're having these new imperial mints um, established um, in different provinces to supply the army. So it looks like, uh, tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong, with Nikaya would have been a kind of, I'm trying to translate um, what well, I would say in French, ballon d'essai. I mean, you, you're trying something. Um, they need to supply the local army with small change. It's, it's expensive to, to carry bronze coins from Rome. Um, Nikai is almost on the Black Sea, so with the Danube and the Black Sea, the logistical uh, cost uh, would be easier before the establishment of, of, of local mint. So that's sort of my first question. But second, could we link the presence of these coins to troop movements during the Civil War? Uh, Septimus Severus had, had brought troops into Asia Minor, then some of these troops must have gone back to the Danube uh, regions. So can we link it with some actual movements uh, or legionary movements between Asia Minor and, and the Danube area? Well, I think we can to some extent, but not specifically to Bithynia. I think maybe some part of region, parts of Pontus might be, have been more affected. Uh, I tried to find something in the epigraphic evidence, uh, but there is not much, honestly, to uh, support this sort of idea, because I, I obviously had come to my mind that it could have been something similar. Um, um, as a matter of fact, I mean, it, it's, I, I do not rule out the possibility that coins, to some extent, were even struck specifically on mm. situ, because we do have limus falsa, uh, not only of uh, imperial denari, but we also have limus falsa of provincial coins. And again, Nicaea is by far the, uh, the best attested among, among these. So um, it, it is a possibility. Um, on the other hand, it's a phenomenon that also spans uh, uh, 20 years with the period in which we have uh, peaks of production, clearly under Severus Alexander and under Gordian. And then it goes down completely under Maximinus tracks. So um, um, I'm not sure if, if this could depend on the movement of the army, uh, but uh, uh, it is, of course, a possibility that they, they travel along with the army, um, if that's what. And sorry, I can't remember what was your, your, the, exactly the, the first question. You... Yeah, I, I, I was thinking about the, the cost. I, moving bronze coins is it's heavy, it's bulky. Expensive. Uh, mm -hmm. Plus, uh, the denominational value of these coins is, is much yeah. lower, so it cannot be economical for the imperial uh, authorities to, to move these coins uh, to the religion. So, uh, um, Nikkei very close to the uh, we cannot can hear you. Sorry. So you were breaking. Oh, oh, maybe it's my, my internet connection. No, I was asking. Do you think logistic consideration would have played a role uh, in shipping these coins by Black Sea and Danube uh, River, uh, using the river to the troops instead of some continental um, cargoes, which would have been more expensive? Well, here is the thing. Um, if we look at the broader picture, uh, before we find, uh, because uh, basically, as I explained before, the whole region does not have a bronze coin supply uh, made locally, okay, at least in the in the Severan period. Um, so, if we look at the coin finds in Biminacum, for instance, but generally speaking, the region, before we begin to start the flow or, or whatever, if they flow or if they're made locally of, of Bithynian coins, uh, we find coins from Stobi in Macedonia, which is just across the border. So, uh, and that again, uh, suggests to me that 
that there was an attempt to try to supply uh, a currency in still the same kind of denominational value, so very low or, or medium low, um, for the shortage for the shortage of, of, of uh, small change in the area, and and that the first attempt might have been, as you say, most cost effective because it was clearly closer and possibly easier. Uh, but then clearly something didn't didn't work. Uh, maybe because Stobi was not uh, mint capable of coping with this, and and after Caracalla, if I remember correctly, the mint. Uh, quit its production. Um, then the, the, why they would go and pick up a mint so far away, which, as you say, uh, would probably cost effective, not be very much efficient. Um, it's uh, to me, it's only because uh, the mint had a, a, a specific role on a provincial level. So I think this must have been managed on a provincial level, um, and. Um, um, somehow it might have it might have been more cost effective than what they did before, but not uh, as cost effective enough as to keep it going after Gordian, because after that they clearly realized that this was not going to work on the long term, and so they decided to open two mints precisely in the area which needed the supply. So I think for a certain time it might have been. Uh, a good solution, but maybe just a temporary one. And then uh, at some point, maybe the empire itself took on the, the situation and decided to simply uh, do what, what it must have been uh, easier to do, or, or at least more practical to, to do. Thank, thank you very much. I mean, we are uh, past, uh, let's say, our 2 p.m. Uh, it's just uh, that this was a parody of course, this was very interesting. We have just last question. If you have just, if you could answer briefly, but are no, there... I'm, I'm not aware of any of any fine spots of the severance Sistofoy. This is also something that I was looking for, obviously, but uh, even I think even Metcalf had the same problem in the first place. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, Dario. Grazie, thank you very much for this most informative talk, really fantastic. Uh, and we're most grateful because you did it even after one more lecture <laughs> you had this morning, <laughs> this, uh, this afternoon. So thank you and enjoy your weekend. Uh, really. you and uh, see you soon, hopefully. It's been a privilege. Thank you very much. Grazie. And uh, bye -bye. Have, a good, have a good weekend, everyone. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye.